So hi everyone, uh, I'm Niklas Sarakari and uh, thanks for having me Helsek and especially you, you who misspelled my name on the slides, so thanks. And I was actually thinking about talking today about InfoSec consulting and career progression since I've been doing consulting work in information security now a little bit over eight years and I think I've seen pretty much everything at this point. So I was thinking about a little bit sharing my own experiences and tricks and uh, like recommendations maybe that if anyone is interested of doing infosec consulting like what it will potentially entail and so on. A uh, little bit about myself, uh, I'm uh, working as a red teamer at F-Secure, I'm uh, also as a senior security consultant and well of course I'm a fan of beer, especially craft beer, so if you ever want to talk about beer, coffee or design furniture and board games then I'm the guy to hit up. So. I'm especially interested of talking these stuff and also uh, I do love owning stuff so there's nothing better than you know when when designing and creating a let's say a phishing campaign and when that initial shell comes through from the client client network it's always that little amount of adrenaline that you get is like awesome. So a little bit of background myself uh, I used I started as a sysadmin and doing local service desk work uh, over like let's say 14, 15 years ago. So I've been in IT roughly 15 years now. And I got an opportunity to start working in InfoSec and especially in consulting in early 2012. And actually, uh, previously, I wanted to be or go to a, a separately different profession. So I kind of ended up in InfoSec as, as, as to my surprise as well. But I've been enjoying it ever since, uh, even though life as a consultant is time to time quite rough and hard, but it's also super interesting and you get to do a lot of interesting projects and, uh, and seeing like interesting stuff and meeting interesting people. So what I've been uh, mostly doing all these previous years when I started in InfoSec, well, basically I've done lots, lots of web app assessments, host assessments, like uh, larger internal pen tests, more like this white box that you just you go with your laptop into a client internal network and you're just rummaging around and looking into vulnerabilities and dropping shells and seeing like what are different uh, technical issues that you can find and then try to help the client to do that. And there's also vulnerability management. I've done lots of security training for developers and IT guys, especially regarding web app security and also uh, segment stuff. So, you know, like this man management related projects, uh, threat modeling, architectural security risk analysis, uh, risk risk assessment, and so on. So quite a vast and interesting range of projects I've been doing these past years. So a little bit about, I was thinking about talking about, so what is consulting in general and what it actually covers? Uh, when we, and I think this is more like in the in a high level, I was thinking, in my in my own spare time and doing these slides like how would i uh, like separate uh, infosec areas or consulting in general and well of course we have this like this management management side which basically covers like compliance stuff risk assessment uh, like where you can think about pci dss uh, gdpr gdpr related uh, related projects uh, and cases that you might be working on and then you have the tech, tech side that you have like the offensive side, the defensive side. Uh, you can, as I, as I said, like web app pen testing, internal pen tests, uh, phishing campaigns, uh, host assessments, etc. And between these two, you also have the research side. So you can basically do research covering both of these aspects. So uh, I think I'm in more related to the tech side. So of course, this talk is also covering more in or going more deep into the tech side experiences that I have as I don't have that deep, let's say, experience on doing man management related projects in any case. But it's thinking about in research that when you talk about like offensive security research, you do exploit development, you're uh, trying to find, let's say, zero days and writing proof of concepts and 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 like trying to enhance your own skills or, your, or the skills of the company and the capabilities to do further, uh, let's say, more, more specialized testing when we talk about or think about maybe red teaming or phishing, phishing campaigns, for example, in my personal uh, experience was that uh, some years ago when I got to do my first phishing campaigns or phishing project, I was actually didn't 
wasn't that maybe well versed or had that much knowledge about SMTP or DKIM or SPF related technologies that are used to protect and secure the email environments uh, in more techno technological way. So it actually was quite painful in the beginning to go through and searching all that information by yourself and thinking about like, what can I do to try to bypass these specific spam filters, etc. and what are the uh, simple or basic techniques or advanced techniques that you can try to discover and, and use to actually try to bypass certain protection mechanisms. And then we have the consulting on top. So this, in, especially in InfoSec consulting, and basically it covers all these three different aspects. And I think in my personal opinions, uh, the consulting, you, when you think about consulting, you have the more like the segment consults that actually work on the risk assessment stuff, uh, compliance stuff. And then you have the tech guys who actually do those uh, technical related assessments like web apps, host assessment, red teaming, uh, defensive, Defensive testing, uh, you might think about purple teaming. Uh, you might have SOC analysts uh, working as, a consul as, as consultants and so on. So basically consulting in general is covers like quite wide array, array of expertise and requires a lot of knowledge on different aspects that you can actually try to work on, work on your own skills and like further your own, own skills and moving forward in your career. Now, if people try to think about, so how does the consulting career progression works? I think the most, I will try to cover like, what is maybe the most basic way to move forward in your career is basically initially, not, well, this is not, maybe not everyone does, does it as this way, but the most common one would be probably that you will start as a trainee if you are an entry level person who is just joining InfoSec and doing professional work in InfoSec and uh, maybe just directly out of school or something, then you most likely will start as a trainee, which is basically you start to build your or develop your own skills within the company. You might get trainings during that time that you have started and like what and introduction to different aspects of consulting, like how do you do customer work, what is reporting, uh, what is quality assurance and how do you report your findings, how do you collect information and what, what, what is project management and that sort of stuff. And from there you might move, might move forward into more of a junior position. And in my opinion, it's more like when you get into the junior position, you actually are able to and be trusted to start delivering on customer projects. And this is not like you don't really have any further responsibility on the customer's side when thinking about this specific position, but you are more, more like a supporting role uh, having having capabilities to join other projects and see like real life systems and see how they work and try to find issues in these. And when you move forward and you develop your own skills and you get expertise and you get more know more about consulting work and you have this uh, experience and also like career progression when you think year wise maybe between junior or regular it's probably somewhere between a year or two. Uh, depends, of course, personally on everybody's own expertise, skills and desires. But as a regular consultant, then you start moving forward into like you are able to lead uh, specific projects like web app assessments, host assessments and this sort of stuff. And you are able to communicate with the customer and provide them insights and uh, make sure that all the reports and all the findings are gathered and uh, documented appropriately. And then you also, this also builds on the previous previous phases that you have more experience on delivering multiple uh, multiple different projects that requires different uh, certain uh, expertise. And from regular, then you start working into, into a senior role, uh, which I'm at, at the currently current moment. And this is more like as a trusted advisor role that when you have built with years of experience on different different level of projects and different uh, different skill sets and you have worked closely with different several customers then you might get into a position that you have certain uh, specific customers in your in your company that they actually trust you to trust your insights your input and actually want to definitely work with you which also gives you this ability to have certain let's say responsibility into managing like what kind of projects you get to deliver and in in some perfect cases you might also have this possibility to actually choose your own projects in certain cases 
And when we build through, through seniority, then uh, probably the last or the ultimate role in consulting might be a principal of a lead consulting. And this is maybe then goes more like into the mentoring or coaching mode. And you are able to work maybe more into the business development. So if, if we think maybe uh, application security as a business or service area in, in general, you might be in this specific role. You might start to think like, how can you further develop this specific service area and, and, and build on other consultant skills and see how their career progression might move forward. So this actually also requires a lot of like deep expertise and experience, like builds through years of experience that you've been working in consulting and allows you to actually take uh, much more responsibility and think about what will be the greatest and newest, coolest things that you can start to think uh, and providing uh, more uh, expertise to your clients. And of course, when thinking through this career progression, uh, the further you get to, through the pipeline, the more responsibility or accountability you also get. So of course, let's say many, I, I know many consultants who are fine just being a senior, senior role because when you go further down, down the road, you get these like, like financial uh, responsibilities and commitments that you must, must deliver. And it also brings that you maybe don't get to deliver that much like on the cool tech stuff that you've been doing like let's say the last six, seven, eight or 10 years, but you still want to be like just doing the base, doing the hacking into the client's environments and just managing the reporting and just move on forward to the next project. But when you go further down the pipeline and you see that there might be, might, might be more into it, then especially like business development and service area leading is something that gives you a, like a different point of view on how things can be actually be better and maybe it goes more like of this how how you might in, like personally think about how to make more impact by uh, building your own capabilities or your team capabilities so if you're looking more into responsibility and accountability then definitely moving forward into the principal or lead role is something that you should also look, look forward to and I, I think, I'm not sure if how many of you are familiar with Tim Malcolm better, but he's basically the red team lead for, for, I think it's for Walmart. And I think this is one of the greatest slides I've ever, or tweets I've ever seen from him. And as for myself, as I currently I'm working as a red team service lead in AppSecure. And I've been like struggling personally with the fact that I don't really get that much time to do anymore. Like this, this hacking and like dropping shells and moving laterally through the networks. But it's more like I sit on meetings uh, with the customers internally and try to like be the firewall between uh, business and my team to let them do the, all the cool stuff and just watching in the background and trying to be able that all the expectations are met. So you might, I don't know if you ever heard like expectation management and stuff like that, but it's like really important when you're working as a project lead or a service lead or whatever, that you don't really hug all that cool stuff to yourself, but you let others to shine and let others to do that stuff and what they enjoy and what they are comfortable with. Uh, this is uh, related to, uh, I see, I saw this uh, similar, similar, uh, similar pie chart some years ago in Twitter, but I was, I was unable to find it anymore. So I tried to build this based on my, Based, my, based on my own recollection regarding that specific pie chart. So I tried to like build on like what is consulting in general and you might see certain aspects here like reporting is quite heavily heavily involved in this case and it's not, a, it's not actually a joke but it's actually a, a harsh reality that reporting is one of the most important skills you might you actually need in consulting because most of your work is related to reporting. Uh, you report to the client, you write, you write uh, pro proposals, you write your findings, you report your findings, you report, uh, write your final report. You actually have to have some meaningful content in it because that's basically the final product that, that, that your customer has or the one who, who you are delivering the project. So if your report is, is basically shit, then it basically doesn't matter anymore because the client really doesn't see the value even though depending, even though depending like how how cool or awesome findings you might have, but un unless if you're unable to 
tell the client like what is the impact is, what is the business impact on these findings and why you should care about this, then it doesn't really matter anymore. But of course it, it involves these cool, nice things like owning stuff, but you also have uh, like a lot of meetings. Uh, you have to see through scoping meetings, like seeing like what is this uh, upcoming project going to entail, like how are you are going to deliver it, what is the approach to it, uh, what are the communication models, and then there's also a lot of despair depending on what kind of project you are delivering. You might think, well, yeah, it's very easy to find some, some certain security issues, but then your payload doesn't work and you don't know why it doesn't work, and then you spend hours or days on Google, or you start, let's say, or if you are doing a red teaming or internal pen test, and you try to find your achieve your objectives, but you just cannot achieve it. And it's like, it's a lot of like banging your head through the wall. So it, it requires a lot of, a lot of, um, how would I say it? Well, can't remember the word right now, but basically it requires a lot of dedication. So something that I get asked a lot since I've been doing red team, red teaming now for two years is like, how to, how to join red teaming is, is red teaming for me. And why cannot that, why, why I cannot do red teaming because I've been doing these, this stuff for, for one or two years now. And I, I'm really know my way into, in true networks. And I really know like how to own stuff. So what, it, what red teaming actually is, it's basically you try to evaluate an organization's detection and response capabilities. So your point when you when you're doing a red team or you're part of a red team, you have to have an ability or capabilities to actually simulate a real world threat actor that and you and use those same capabilities and techniques and tactics that they, that they use in the real world and try to see like how how well that specific target organization is able to detect you or are they or do they or maybe they don't have the, the capability at all. And also it's about discovering flaws in processes and lack of ownership. So you might, you might have specific objectives that you have to get into this highly secured uh, process automation network, or you have this specific uh, invoicing system or ERP system or whatever. And when you go into that and you start hacking through it and taking information out of it, but then there's no ownership, ownership into it. And it's basically the idea is to, is to try to help the customer to identify these critical gaps in their processes and in secure in and security and see how mature organization they are to actually starting to react into stuff. Uh, for a uh, pretty nice example for this, we have we were doing our red teaming last year, and we were we were uh, infiltrated the customer's network, and at some point they were able to detect us and uh, the, their SOC started to get the hunch where we are in the network. And the recommendation was that basically we need to now, or they, the recommendation for the customer, and they were discussing it, that they have to shut the network down completely so they can start eradicating us and our presence from there and finding all the backdoor C2 channels and everything to clean up the network. But what happened in this specific case was that they weren't actually aware of who was the ownership or who had the ownership to decide stuff like that, that they are, basically closing down their whole whole network from the internet. So they weren't able to do that because they didn't know who was responsible of it. So they, in this case, we were basically just allowed to continue moving, moving across the network and achieving our objectives. And red teaming also, it's basically a team of operators with a wide range of skills and capabilities. So when you think about Red teaming, you have your infrastructure, you have your payload development, tool development, you have your AD guys, your open source intelligence guys, your physical security guys, your phishing guys, like all these capabilities that you are able to go through the whole whole attack life cycle through, through from reconnaissance phase until you achieve your objectives that you are given for that specific project. And also it basically builds on I, uh, maybe I would even say on ultimate trust, especially between the team members, because you have to be able to trust your teammates or your operators in that specific team completely and make sure that they are able and capable of delivering and performing actions that doesn't put danger the other guys or your presence to, in the network. And why I also have to mention clients here is because um, in red teaming, it's basically different than when you think about uh, basic penetration testing in an internal network because you are actually working in live production systems and you try to hack into critical 
critical functions might be a mainframe in a bank or the process automation network or whatever, but it's basically business critical to that specific company and failing failing to do that securely or securely might actually result in significant losses for the client themselves. So that is something that has to be taken care of. So, and what red red teaming is not, well, it's not basically dropping zero days all day long on a client network or or just running shells here and there and yelling through the networks that you run scans here and you run scans over there. But it's more like being being operationally secure, being quiet, moving moving slowly in the network and waiting for that right chance. And it's, and if you're thinking like, yeah, if I work as a security consultant, I can start at nine and stop at set, stop at five. When you're doing some basic web apps, yeah, that's that's perfectly doable and fine. Why not? But when you're doing a red team, you might be waiting that well, our our phishing email leaves around 4:30 p.m let's say, depending on the time zones, and then you get a shell, let's say, back at 8 p.m. So what do you do? You just sit around and go back in the morning to the office and wait, maybe that shell is still there. Maybe our automation worked and we have persistence. Do you trust that much into it? And also, when you try to simulate a real-world attacker, you also have to work like 24-7 in a way that you, depending like what kind of attacker you are simulating and how are and what are the perfect chances to go or access some certain systems or information and also when you think about red teaming it's not like when you get into the network you you just achieve your object objectives but it actually takes a lot of time a lot of patience to collect that information and waiting for that right moment and this is isn't actually my quote i don't remember who actually said this or said it specifically like this but in my opinion, this is true in a way because even though you're a great pen tester, it does not necessarily make you a great red teamer. And there's an idea behind this, in my opinion as well, is that even though you are like a really capable uh, pen tester and you're really, really successful on finding complex flaws in web apps or in when you're doing reverse engineering and that sort of stuff, but in, in any case or in general, especially in red teaming, it's more like the most stupidest things usually work. It's basically password spraying uh, these simple pa- simple lists of passwords that you have. Like in my previous HealthSec talk, I was also talking about what is the most common way to get into a network is like doing a password spray with with a month and a year. So now if you would run like June 2020 in a customer network, you would probably get hundreds of pa- hundreds of valid credentials. So it's very rarely it's anything like finding memory corruptions and writing complex exploits as a proof of concept that some some enjoy really much because that's not what red teaming generally is. It's more like thinking the business as a whole and figuring out like how how can I interrupt, let's say, this specific invoicing process when I try to mangle with these findings that we have in that environment. So when you think about would you want to do red teaming or pen testing in general, you really have to think about like what do you want to build your capabilities on. And I know a lot of guys also in FC or in other companies that are like fantastic pen testers and are really capable of finding awesome, awesome issues, but might not really enjoy like doing red teaming. Or when you think about it, you go start doing physical intrusions and you have to physically go and you physically go to the customers location and you have to do some social engineering stuff and talk your way in or tailgate people and what if someone encounters you so how do you react into it and how do you how do you work through that and when thinking about red teaming also in general like the different domains that it entails this is i would say it's not an exhaustive list but it's something that gives some direction like what red teaming is built upon so the different color codes are like trying to figure out like section of access control and physical intrusion. It's more like in, the, in the, this like physical world, uh, secure, security. And then the green ones are more like into the project management. So you have the scoping and reporting. And then the blue ones are more into tech stuff. So you have your open source intelligence, social engineering techniques like phishing, uh, a lot of like Active Directory stuff. And when you think about infrastructure, it's like you have the uh, customer's infrastructure, but you also have your own red teaming infrastructure. Like how do you 
securely and safely deploy and design and maintain your own infrastructure that actually holds a lot of sensitive customer related information and because th that also brings a lot of like uh, security overhead to the team itself and like responsibility and manageability to make sure that everything is secure and, and maintained securely. And also like OPSEC, like operational security is one of the key points when talking about when people ask also might, why they not might, might not be able to join to, to, to do red teaming is you can just drop into the network and start running stuff. You always have to have like sort of risk analysis approach to think about so I know your tools and know what they look like on the other side and if you if I run this specific tool and if there is a sock in place what do the what can they see on uh, what are the artifacts on that tool and if I run this and if they detect it what are our next steps you always have to think ahead like a lot and on red one it's more like then you have like your own own tooling and your own payload so when you run a phishing campaign you also have their payloads that that will bypass everything that they have, whether it's antivirus or EDR products uh, or egress filtering on the network. Uh, I don't know if anybody has heard Dunning-Kruger effect, but this is something that I've been struggling uh, in my early, early years in my career. And sometimes I think this fits also very well on red teaming in general, or like in InfoSec career progression is that it's like this cognitive bias that you might think that you know everything and you're the most greatest and coolest pen tester ever, but you might actually think, see in, in later phases in your career that that was not actually true, but you see that there is a lot of lot more into it than just running verb active scanner and finding those false positives and reporting those. And you might go start in, in this point, you might be in the peak of Mount Stupid that you think about well, actually, I really don't know anything about security, and you might fall into the valley of despair that I really don't have any any capabilities, and you might think about imposter syndrome that everybody is much better than me, and so on. But that's not the case. I mean, I I'm, I suffer imposter syndrome every now and then, and I have a lot of colleagues who also suffer from imposter syndrome. But I think that's just part of life. But the idea is to understand that you cannot be expert at everything, and what I've been telling almost when I've been talking more juniors one is that you should try to pick maybe two or three different areas of expertise that you want to get really good at and then build more general knowledge around different areas of aspects. So you might think you want to be really good at that with web apps and infrastructure stuff. And then you might be some capabilities into exploit development and reverse engineering, which also already builds you a quite well-versed well capabilities doing infosec work. So one thing that gets talked a lot or is something that maybe not everybody is aware of, but I think everyone who has been done years of consulting knows, knows what this means. And I think this is something mandatory that everybody has to go through. It's like grinding, grinding through projects. You have to grind through those web apps, those host assessments, doing on-site work, sitting long hours, reporting, getting, getting boomerangs from QA, just to build your own capabilities and skill levels to actually move forward in your in your career you cannot just expect that you've been doing one year or two years of uh, security consulting and you're able to deliver like very complex high level projects with with secure environments so everybody has to in my opinion to pay pay the money to actually move forward in their career and what about certifications? Well, I think, in my opinion, it doesn't hurt to have certifications and they do help a lot and they might uh, fast pace you in your career. But I think they are not also a requirement per se, because, well, I have I've been doing some certifications in my life. And at some point, I just figured out that they, I don't really have any any use for them anymore. They do, did help me some in the early phases of my career, but now I now I more like see it as a as an annoyance, filling those CPE points and trying to get them renewed every every now and then. So I definitely recommend doing certifications if you if you're in your early phases of career and it helps you show your expertise on specific areas and build and fast fast move fast forward some of your skill sets. But I wouldn't say they are mandatory. 
And as already several times been said, uh, reporting is one of the most important skills when doing consulting. So if you can figure out ways how to develop your reporting skills, then I will definitely go for it, whether it's uh, courses on reporting or just rehearsing with, with someone or if you have a place or in a company you're already doing consulting work, just being involved in reporting and QA process really helps to see like how you how you can develop and how you can bring that that impact of or the business impact or those proof of concepts into life and see what are what is the value of for the customer in this case then uh, ownership this is something that if you want to move i think one of the most important facts in your career could be or would be if you want to move forward in your career is to take ownership of stuff so when you, when you think about you know, when you're delivering projects and you might have a project lead who was not really stepping up and re not really doing anything and you get lagged behind or the project is seem to be failed, then I mean then then that is like in your opportunity to shine by taking ownership and showing that you are able to be, be responsible one and go and go moving forward with this and take through the project and seeing the results. So this is one of the most important things in regards also with reporting that I think that everyone should be aware of. And not to forget the most, another most important thing is to push to VETA or, or more likely networking. So I think when you network, especially in Finland with InfoSec Consulting, it also opens up a lot of doors for you in a way that you, you, you get to show yourself like what kind of person you are because nobody wants to work with assholes. So Having, having these places of like Helsek or Turkusek or whatever to see and meet new people and you also might get interesting opportunities from that. And I have some book, book recommendations that actually change like my views of consulting and just work in general that I really recommend everyone to go through. Uh, first one is the trusted advisor. It's more like building your consulting capabilities and how to, how to, how to actually bring value to your customer like that point of view. And then this extreme ownership that is currently also on loan with one of my ex-colleagues. I hope he gets to read it soon so I can pass it on to another, another friend of mine. And that, that talks especially on like how, how taking that ownership might actually help you move forward and taking accountability. And then Tribal Leadership is an interesting book. It's more like uh, the asymmetries or about teamwork and what kind of different teams there are and how to work on work on different people in in different environments and then also the network attacks and exploitation of framework this is an excellent book especially regarding offensive and defensive security so i definitely recommend checking these out and for my last slide i just want to leave this here for everyone as a motivation i hopefully to think about like how they could probably in the future start developing themselves and bring bring themselves forward and getting getting themselves out there thank you thank you very much mr sirosari hopefully i didn't go a lot of overtime it doesn't matter because we were late already uh, because yeah. of my uh, extensive long talk uh, we got a lot of questions for you uh, oh. unfortunately we cannot go through all of them but uh, if you have time after 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 this uh, Q and A, uh, it would be really awesome if you had time to answer them on on the Discord. Yes, I do. Yep. But I I will go uh, with a few few of them here. Uh, let's see. Uh, the first question was about your favorite board game. What it is? Uh, at the moment, it's Terraforming Mars. All righty then. Uh, uh, bah, 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 bah. How long did you ask us the previous question before? Oh, okay, yeah, okay. What's the biggest OPSEC fail you have had as a red teamer? Uh, personally or for the team? Uh, well, either way. Uh, bad password for my backdoor account. Uh, <clears throat> What is your favorite kind of furniture? <laughs> is it tables? <laughs> <laughs> Who asked that? <laughs> Osko. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my it's my Bertoyas diamond chair. Oh, nice. 
Uh, uh, there's a question about the trainee positions in Finland. Uh, do you know if they are usually uh, paid or unpaid? Uh, at least, uh, I, I'm not sure if every, every, all of them are, but I think most of them are, yes. At least in FCGR where I work, there are like paid internships as well. As well? Is there unpaid as well? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe, or, maybe not. All right. Um, at least I, I can tell that my uh, current position uh, in, in Nixu and uh, past, pre- uh, past position in Elisa, uh, all the internships were paid. Yeah. So uh, at I least think, ma- I think majority that, of the companies. I, I, think, I think most of them are because that will be quite bad PR for the company not to pay. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. So, uh, how long uh, does it uh, usually take to climb up the progression ladder? For example, how long does it take to move from re- regular to senior ETC? Um, I worked four years as a regular before I got seniority, and then I worked two two and a half years as a senior in that in that in my previous company. Then I moved to F Secure, and I went to T's Grill. I don't know if you are familiar <laughs> with one that's going grill, and and based on that, I was downshifted back to regular for uh, I don't know, was it a uh, little over a year, and then I bumped back into seniority. So I've been uh, working as a senior for over a year now at F Secure. Yeah, all right, thank you. But very much. Uh, but it's hard to say. It's, it's also depends on your own skill cap, you know, own skills capabilities and like. Yeah, yeah, and the personality and so yeah. on. So, but I think most commonly it's probably three, four years. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, how much of a consultant's work can be done remotely? Uh, thinking about the new normal and how it affects the work. I think quite a lot, In, and of course, it depends on what kind of environments you are testing. Whether it's like everything is on internal network, and then might be easier just to do on-site work, but I think we mostly do like off-site work anyway. But if you think about working remotely for a company, then yeah, I, I really don't see an issue why that wouldn't be possible. I mean, it's, it's, it is possible in several different companies, but in my personal opinion, I really don't enjoy working remotely all the time. So, but I think it's always able to be set up for working remotely. I don't really see issues why companies would say that you are not able to do remote work. Yeah. Uh, a few more questions before we move on. There is a lot of a lot of them more, uh, which you should ask uh, answer later on. Uh, but uh, what comes after being a principal or lead consultant for a few years? Probably setting up your own company. <laughs> Retirement. That's <laughs> that's also something. Uh, and then uh, I, I will randomly randomly uh, pick a one question. Uh, does FSecure pay properly for DFIR consultants? Uh, asking for a friend. I think so. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Niklas. And uh, let's have a few minute break, and then we will continue with the uh, JW John Wick. <laughs> 